Then uh, we will now continue uh, with uh, the first keynote speaker of the day, uh, Oriol Vignans. He's a, a principal scientist at Google DeepMind, and he uh, leads there the deep learning group. Uh, his research interests uh, are uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence, but I uh, can safely add to that that absolutely uh, meta learning and future learning uh, are also a part of this. And uh, of course, we know him from the uh, matching networks uh, paper and many others. Um, and today he will talk about the perspective and frontiers of meta learning. Oriol, uh, the floor is all yours. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Jan. And um, thanks everyone uh, for attending. Um, I probably tuned the talk to be um, so that we can have discussions either throughout or at the end, of course. So please use whichever Zoom features um, you can. And also, I'm hoping that the talk, uh, if it stops, I get to know that um, fun anecdote of, of the current world we live in is that there was an actual Google wide outage whilst I was giving a talk on uh, using uh, Hangouts and using Google Slides as I am today. So uh, that was a very unusual thing, but uh, I hope uh, today it's everything technically speaking goes smoothly. In general, it does, but uh, anyways. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to be seeing Jan like kind of camera so to verify that people are at least um, in the talk. And even though I will um, discuss a bit of, uh, since this is the first talk of the session and thanks for those who tune from early or late times uh, and different time zones i am in london uh, which is actually pretty nice today it's been snowing i went for a walk and um sadly i will not make the panel because of the time zone but of course i'm quite happy to be opening and hopefully you're waking up or maybe you're about to go to sleep um this is a very distributed conference as they have been for for now over um few months and almost a year. Um, meta learning is a very exciting topic. Uh, this is a cute sort of representation of um, an animal that is kind of learning very quickly from their environment. And I, I thought this was, was a nice uh, GIF animation to represent the amazingness of meta learning. I think it's um, not only the progress and the techniques, but just the problem statement itself, I find it amazing. So I'll, I'll use some of the time to, to discuss that from, from my perspective and, and, and personal experience. And of course, as I said, anytime at any point of the talk, um, it would be great to have a already open-ended discussion and, and otherwise at the end as well. Now, before talking to meta learning, maybe one of the things that the world is doing as a whole is doing a lot of uh, few shot learning or zero shot learning uh, in the past year, given that we're living kind of a reality that none of us had training data for, um, I would say, um, governments, um, and of course, like us just uh, trying to figure out how to work from home and doing things that were just kind of completely unexpected. Um, but I just want to recognize that um, it is a difficult time, so I'm hoping everyone is, is fine and safe and their loved ones um, are, are doing and coping well. Um, but, you know, it is, I think, useful and I start most of my talks that I do online just recognizing the, the exceptionality of the situation, but perhaps in a meta learning workshop, um, it's quite adequate to un start understanding um, how lack of training data makes decision making more difficult, which is kind of the business that we, we're kind of in, in terms of defining benchmarks and techniques. So with that aside, uh, let's begin with, um, and I, again, I'll mix a bit of like personal um, experiences here. So when I first kind of learned or, or start thinking about the idea of meta learning, um, it was through, and maybe many of you the same, through the lenses of few shot learning or these amazing capabilities that we have um, from many perceptual inputs, but obviously vision being uh, one that's, that's quite uh, nice to study. Um, this capability we have to, from very few examples or even in the extreme case, one or even zero, um, as we'll discuss a bit later, we have the capability to recognize patterns or classify objects that were never never seen before, right? So obviously this slide is, is slightly old and, and the motivation um, at the time, it was maybe more valid, but um, it is fair to say that even if I present you with an object um, like the one above that 
you might not have seen, and it actually shares a lot of pieces and components um, commonly found in other objects. Um, most humans, if I ask, can you point to the correct object category from these other set of pixels here down, down here, many people would identify the object correctly um, with that one single example of an object category they've never seen. Um, of course, there's a lot of borrow um, knowledge about how real Im real world images and piece um, and components and, and concepts uh, appear in this image, but still it's quite amazing an amazing capability we have that you know most likely um, you would probably point to this object, which is the same category. And likewise, for these sort of alphabets that amazing, uh, amazingly we developed throughout the history of humanity, um, you're unlikely to have seen, although now that you work on meta learning, maybe, maybe that's not so true, but you, you're unlikely to have seen sort of a symbol like this, uh, yet you probably would be able to recognize um, the same symbol, even though pixel by pixel, um, it looks uh, very, very different um, in, in the set of images below. Um, in this case, it, it even seems to be drawn like quite much worse, maybe if, if I don't know this alphabet, but it, it does look like even the matching is this one. It, it, it seems like pretty hard and, and quite distinct, right? So the motivation from Brandon uh, Lake and, and many others was very appealing to study this problem and create a benchmark for, for um, future learning to sort of study the capabilities of machine learning um, or algorithms to identify these patterns so quickly as we do uh, amazingly well. And that really was kind of how I got introduced to, to this setting of uh, future learning for classification. Now, <clears throat> entering meta learning, it is fairly difficult uh, <clears throat> excuse me. It is fairly difficult to agree on a definition. And perhaps if I was in the panel, that would be a fun discussion. So maybe that's a good question um, for the panelists to, to even define concisely what meta learning or learning to learn means. Um, I have an attempt here, um, which is to go beyond this idea of a distribution of data points. Um, that we study from a training and testing set perspective in classical machine learning. Um, and rather we have a distribution of distributions that's fairly big, but I think that definition I, I tend to like. Another definition, which is much more informal that I dislike, but I use it sometimes is, you know that meta learning is happening when you see it, but that's obviously not a definition I would I would argue you should use. Uh, but sometimes some models behave in certain ways of generalization that you you think some some sort of unexpected learning that goes beyond the learning or the training distribution has happened, um, even not provoked by the way you train or you set up your task. And then maybe just to be more historical, um, Hogg Reiter et al. in 2001 um, sort of defined um, meta learning by, by saying that it's a system that impro uh, improves or discovers a learning algorithm, right? So um, your model, trained model, is not just a set of weights that are frozen, but this model somehow learns as you test it on a new task. That's one of the ways to see it, although that is quite imperfect as we'll start seeing very, very soon. And, you know, the, there is some controversy on what constitutes meta-learning versus just a standard machine learning or learning, because I think this definition, as we solve and um, give it for granted that we are doing some amazing things nowadays with machine learning, as we these capabilities evolve, our understanding of what is expected or what's a bit of in this like, oh, this is a meta learning um, occurrence because it went beyond the training distribution also is changing over time, right? For instance, MNIST, in a way you could say, well, you're meta learning because you train on these particular instances of, of zeros, ones and, and numbers, but your testing number is actually not like any that you've seen in training, right? So under this kind of concept, you know, even MNIST classification, you could think of it's meta learning because well, the testing distribution, they're not the same drawings of, of the digits that the digits of course are uh, the labels, those are common, right? Um, now going forward, ImageNet produces 
an even more drastic effect where you say, look, I mean, from a few, and a few means a thousand in ImageNet, which is quite a few, but it's still not that many. For, from, from a thousand images of like a Husky, you now can identify any Husky that you, you, can, you can photograph um, in, and under kind of similar conditions than the ImageNet data set has been collected, right? So isn't that amazing? I mean, wouldn't that, we think that is kind of, oh, that, that's really going beyond the, the training distribution, right? Now, where we start to kind of maybe agree is that if we were to block one full class of labels from the training sets, namely Haskies are now not seen at all, um, we can start dreaming about, I show you a single instance of a class you've never trained on, the label itself you've never seen, and now from a single image, you and a single labeling or a few, a few labeled examples, few, few shots, um, you are supposed to be quite good at identifying these classes, right? And this obviously uh, is the motivation that I showed from, from Brendan Slake's uh, origin, at all, original work. And, you know, we can, we can start maybe even expanding these and say, well, look, I mean, you haven't seen Huskies, but you've seen so many other dogs. So it's actually, it's kind of in distribution because the, the category at large is there. Um, so maybe we should go a bit beyond and say, well, block all the dogs and now, um, I'm going to just ask you to, to be very good at classifying dogs, even though you've never seen a dog whilst training, right? Um, and then perhaps another category that is very beautiful because it combines two modalities, uh, which is that of captioning. You could say, well, I mean, uh, uh, solving image captioning, which is mapping a, a, an image to a sentence that explains the image, is also perhaps a, perhaps a form of meta learning because you know, who has seen this image, which I actually believe is real of, uh, maybe not, sorry if it's not, but I mean, this was a viral image at the time we were working on captioning. But if you have a captioning system that from this clearly kind of not in distribution and an unusual image that we humans find, find quite amusing and we tend to then go and make it viral, right, on social media. So those are maybe the images we would care to caption the most. Um, we, we would be able to um, to caption this correctly, unlike this more prototypical caption that is wrong, which would be like, oh, there's a bird perched on top of a tree branch. I believe captioning has advanced a little bit, state of the art wise, but um, you know, captioning this image is kind of out of distribution. So maybe that is kind of, we could argue language is a nice form to think of meta learning as, as in very out of distribution from where we trained on, right? So. I think that gives this intuition that, okay, what is meta learning? What is standard learning? It maybe is a moving target and we shouldn't worry too much about it. But again, I would love uh, to be in the panel um, either as, a, as an attendee or as a discussant and, and maybe that uh, someone can tell me later on email or, or whatnot um, what happened in the discussion section. Um, I hope you're looking forward to that as well. Uh, cool, so concretizing a bit more, right? Um, to make progress, as we well know in machine learning, we need uh, concrete data sets and metrics. And as I was alluding to, um, a very kind of inspiring moment in, in the field was when very concisely a data set of uh, these kind of um, different alphabets that humanity has developed was proposed as a meta learning task. Um, the point being that this was uh, a thousand plus categories uh, but then there were only a few examples per category uh, to be learned from. So it was the perfect case where you could learn the concept of what constitutes um, a handwritten digits from, from like human history, but then try to see whether you could, um, from learning on this data set, learn to then extrapolate to a new vocabulary very quickly that you hadn't precisely seen uh, while training, right? So in the few shot setting, this was a very nice data set. Now, as I um, was very fascinated by this, um, one thing that came very quickly in realization when we work on, on matching networks in 2016 was that OmniGlot is a great data set, but um, well, we have ImageNet, which actually has a thousand categories, which is order of magnitude the same as OmniGlot. I mean, it, it happens to have more images per, per category, but we can just simplify that and ignore the fact that we have a thousand images and just pretend that we only have 
one or a few images per category in the ImageNet um, uh, sort of labeling or, or classification task. And then just do the same sort of splits of, um, I allow you to train only on a certain subset of labels. And then at test time, I'm going to be asking you to classify objects on uh, labels you've never seen. And that's precisely where we sort of propose, well, look, we're not that far. Omniglot was having or seeing very rapid progress. So let's propose the next challenge um, on natural images. And one such challenge was the mini image net, which is um, a more manageable in size, perhaps version of image net, which to be honest, in retrospect might have been um, too simple or, or it, it has some nuances. I think some of the results we're seeing as I'll discuss might be nuanced because of the size precise size of mini image net, which doesn't even use hundreds um, of, of categories. It, it uses only a subset, uh, a small subset. So now, if I may, um, since I, I, I kind of, um, me and my colleagues, we, we thought hard and we introduced mini image net and another data set that's much more modern from a couple of years ago that I think sounds great to me and maybe we should as a community maybe advance to working more and more on it it's been published and uh, some very uh, exciting results actually are being done is that of metadata set which instead of splitting some labels of onto training labels that you're allowed to train on and testing labels you've never see in this case you go kind of a step further right so what we understand as meta learning goes maybe even a step a step backwards and says look the whole data set not only the labels, but the whole data set can be held out as a test data set, if, if you will, right? And that's a very nice um, departure, whether these data sets are all of the necessary complexity and necessary size to really solve these as we humans can solve this task of, well, I, I mean, even if you've never seen a, te a, 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 a test set of traffic signs, and even if you lived in a country where somehow there were no traffic signs, um, you know, could you still um, recognize these objects? And probably the answer is yes. Now, whether there's enough data in itself in this, that's always kind of a tricky question to ask about these new benchmarks that are proposed for meta learning, of course. But again, a great point for discussion. And regardless, it's it's I think it's a it's a nicer maybe setup um, given the the amount of progress that we've seen on on mini ImageNet and related uh, data sets, of course. Um, and starting from Omniglot, which actually is nicely one of the data sets, same for ImageNet, of course. So I really like this setup and I, I encourage you to stop using kind of the one we propose if you can, or, or at least use this one or consider expanding the horizon of data sets that are available for meta learning. Um, there are other data sets I'm not going to touch too much upon on today, but maybe Chelsea uh, in her uh, keynote will will talk more about robotics as a very nice domain for meta learning as well. Very necessary because obtaining data there, um, special labeled data is, is very, very challenging for obvious reasons. Cool. So let me actually try to give you a bit of a dissection of the kinds of methods we've seen. Um, and that's really going to make the talk um, and, and that's it, right? But um, one very interesting property, very beautiful property of, of meta learning is that it touches upon um, one categorization that I start using in, in general in machine learning. Um, so I, I've given a, a talk more talking about the tools that deep learning has provided us, uh, including attention, recurrent networks, convolutional networks, and so on. And I think you can pretty much characterize most of machine learning or even AI research these days by understanding four components, um, the data, uh, the model, right? The mapping from the input to the output, what precisely the model looks like, a loss function, which of course can include regularization terms and so on and so forth. And last but not least, some process of optimization of finding parameters of the model, right? And if you think about it, reinforcement learning, unsupervised learning, uh, machine learning can be seen as touching or modifying one of these components. Meta learning has this nice property that if you think, depending on the style of algorithm, but I think um, some of them actually touch upon all the four components at once, right? So if you think of a meta learning algorithm, um, maybe you're actually modifying all of the aspects of your, of your problem um, because you're thinking about 
ingenious ways to produce new tasks. That's a new way to provide data. The model itself has to be structured in a certain way to be very data efficient. The laws, of course, might include some dot products, some uh, metric based uh, classifiers, etc. And of course, last but not least, you might need to optimize parameters at test time using some creative ways which people might, might, uh, might find also quite interesting and useful in meta learning. So with that sort of zoomed out view of machine learning, um, let's look a bit into kind of how each of these components is changed in a maybe more traditional uh, few shot way. Um, if this is very basic, I mean, I'm sorry, but I think it's, it's useful to set things um, a bit for those who might also be learning about meta learning or curious about it. So, in general, as I was kind of alluding to, the few shot setting in image classification generally is fairly straightforward. You have a set of labels, um, labels be being like image categories in, in ImageNet, for instance, that you're allowed to, to use during training. You're allowed to use any of these 900 out of 1,000 ImageNet classes during training, right? But how you're, you're going to use them is the question, right? You have 900 um, times however many images you have, and how do you induce this kind of capability for meta learning? And that's kind of one of the things that um, has been brilliantly more, most advanced by many is to set up these tasks in a way that resemble what you're going to be asked to do in training. The way to do that is very simple. Um, one such way would be, okay, at test time, I know I'm going to be giving one single image from a class label category that I've never seen. So let's actually, during training, emulate this procedure precisely so that training and test conditions are the same, right? And that's precisely the intuition behind um, this style of training, which is replicated by a lot of methods, I would say which is, okay, from the set of allowed labels, so let's pick a few of them, let's say four, right? These, these four styles or um, not styles, obviously, like breeds of dogs. Um, and then given the breeds of dogs that we've sampled randomly, let's pick a single category um, at random from the set of uh, classes that we have labeled, right? So these would be four such examples with their corresponding labels. The labels are kind of meaningless. So that, let's just think these, we, we don't need to know the exact name or the letters. This is more like a category, right? This is a four-way classification task in this sense. And then at the same time, we're only also gonna sample a query image, right? Or a test image that we, we're gonna be using to drive the loss, right? So this image, um, corresponds to one of these four categories, um, but we treat it slightly differently. What we're going to do with this is actually ask our algorithm that given this, what we call support set, that the, the set that supports the classification task at hand, we're going to then try to make a classifier that can map this image to the correct label. In this case, the red label is the correct one via a loss and an optimization process, right? So if you kind of write this down as generically as it can be written down, um, this is the style loss that you see, right? You, you're in the business of finding or maximizing the probability of the correct uh, label Y, this red label, given the X, the image, and also given the support set that sort of defines or grounds you to this particular task that you will care to do very well at test time when the set of labels that you'll be sampling from are never been seen during training. Um, and then there's obviously some expectations through this sampling process that I mentioned. There's here some contrasting with supervised learning, but let's skip this. And let me just mention uh, a very motivating keynote from ICML 2015 by Leon Boudou, who kind of argued that the experimental paradigm that machine learning was in, which was there's a training set that is kind of an test set and this this is kind of fixed a priori and um, was very limiting and he was arguing for more paradigms in which we can devise these training and testing protocols beyond the usual train on on some on some task and then test on so same instances of the same task and i think um he argued that working towards expanding this could save decades and i would argue that Meta learning is trying to contest the, the, the simple paradigm, even though at the, at the same time is using a lot of the terms we know, like meta training set and meta testing set. But I, I, I would 
love to see more creativity around um, how to create uh, new testing paradigms for our machine learning algorithms. Great. So, okay, so that's that's the setting. And the question becomes, okay, this is a cool object. Um, what is the model that is able to do this mapping, right? What kind of research enables this? And this is quite slow, uh, not slow, sorry. This is quite uh, old. Um, it's from 2017. I didn't care to, or even dare to, to update this, but I'm gonna explain you very briefly and then actually motivate the maybe the least use or the least known one nowadays of ways to do meta learning um, with a very recent example. Uh, but there, I always find it useful to categorize and these are not um, exact boundaries across all of them. Um, there's many methods that merge or use more, um, more from one, but also a bit of the other, but Generally, I think of three taxonomies for doing this, approximating this probability of Y given X and a support set. One is model-based, the other is metric-based, and the last but not least um, is optimization-based. So how is model-based? That's actually the most um, deep learning one, if you will. I, I, I as, as, as it was mentioned, I, I love deep learning. I'm leading the team of deep learning at DeepMind. So maybe the, the most kind of, um, I, you know, data agnostic way to think of this problem is, okay, we want to approximate an output given two inputs. Let's literally have a neural network that inputs both X and the set and then outputs Y. And there are many ways to structure such neural network um, complicated function approximation, but one very natural one in the case of few shot classification is to think of it as kind of a set, is a, is a training set uh, in the end. So um, this could be treated as a proper set by a transformer, which is set invariant, for example. And you load your set into your kind of working memory of a neural network. And then given the image, you just try to maximize the probability of the correct class. What could go wrong? That's it. That's your model. It's a function. And you don't do anything else. At, te at test time, you take this frozen F, you apply it to your problem, and you evaluate it, right? So it's a very elegant, simple, actually, form of this uh, probability of Y given X and S. It's a very kind of end-to-end -end way to see the problem. Um, now, one that um, has been utilized quite a bit as well is to use a bit of structure known from the problem at hand, namely that this is not just any set that you want to input or condition your model on. This is a set that supports decisions, meaning that there is going to be at some point some sort of comparison between things in the set and your query image X. So knowing that there is some sort of comparison point um, to make the decision of how much this image is equal to these images in the set, um, it becomes very natural to parameterize with a some inductive bias this function. Um, and instead of being as generic as just input everything and, and output a probability distribution, you utilize these symmetries, et cetera, that use dot products or a kernel in general between the image, the query image, and then each image in the in the support set. This limits a bit the applicability of this method because it supposes maybe some sort of classification task at hand, but it is popular, it is powerful, and it produces some good results as we'll see in a second. Um, and it's good to maybe characterize it separately, although I would be kind of quite okay to take this metric-based meta learning and fold it into the model-based meta-learning. Um, I think it's, it's, it could be a good simplification, perhaps, instead of three categories, thinking of two. And last but not least, and this one is the one that perhaps goes more along the lines of Hogg Reiter's definition of what meta-learning is. Um, this one um, parameterizes this probability of Y given X and S by saying, OK, I'm going to learn a, a neural net function that is, has some parameters theta, and it takes the input x and it produces the output. But I'm going to actually think of the parameters of this neural net as something that I want to condition on the set of evidence, uh, the support set s. So in this way, 
um, f is not a fixed function anymore. Its parameters will somehow adapt, and there are a variety of methods to do that, but they will somehow adapt to the little evidence that I'm seeing um, given the few shot support set S. And a very popular method uh, developed actually by uh, Chelsea and collaborators, which is MAML, precisely does one single gradient step um, along the direction of um, an inner loss that um, is optimized end to end. So the beautiful part of all these is that you can still um, maximize the probability that you care about by back propagating through the process of updating your parameters given the set of evidence. And so this theta of S um, in general will take some form of initial parameters that you can back propagate into plus then some update rule, which in MAML is just a single SGD step, for instance. But there's a quite a different variety of methods. And I believe most of which that are now are state of the art update their parameters using some sort of domain adaptation principles, which seems to be quite powerful. So to sum up, I'm just showing here the equations. We've just seen them. So this is just a nice kind of visualization of the same object um, we, from three or maybe two different perspectives that researchers have attacked this problem with. Um, and then, as I was saying, um, since the introduction of, of, the, of the data set um, in, in 2016 or so, there's been tremendous sort of progress on, on what's, um, you know, on few shot, like these, these numbers, I believe, are from um, five shot uh, classification, five way, meaning five, uh, five way and five shots. So five examples for five way classification. So chance would be one over five. So we started quite much better than by chance. Humans probably are at 100%. I mean, five having identify five different objects given one image, which is not that hard, but uh, image net images sometimes might look a bit ambiguous what class they convey. But regardless, there's been a very nice and steady set of both work as we see that with the uh, kind of the number of points and also state of the art has been sort of improving from 40s to, um, I mean, maybe we'll reach 90 if, if more work is being done in this data set, which I would argue, I was arguing maybe we, it's, it's okay to sort of declare it sort of soft given its limitations and move on, right? But regardless, it's very nice to see and then a bit of an analysis to wrap up um, uh, the talk before like a more thought provoking um, uh, frontier that I see and, and then going to questions is to also sort of given the leaderboard identify in the three categories, uh, which ones are dominant and as I was saying optimization based meta learning seems to be winning in terms of raw performance. Um, there's some metric base and model base that pop up. This is, by the way, very imperfect. Like obviously all the methods care deeply about which model uh, they're using, uh, but this is more at inference time, whether they optimize their parameters or update their parameters um, or not. And it's my interpretation of these papers. I, I, I am very happy to stand corrected. If you email me, I'm, I'm gonna update this slide, of course. Uh, Cool. So let's go actually to the, you know, the least performing one, which is this kind of simple and appealing one, which is the model based meta learning. And let me just end up with a kind of a bit of thought provoking um, pointer that maybe it's obvious to most of you, but maybe it's not right. So let's recap, right? Model based meta learning. Okay. It's, it's very drastic. You get this support set. It's, it's a small set or a, a small sequence of okay, here is an image and it's label and it's all the, this, this image and it's label. Now, please, given this image, please produce the, the right label. So very appealing, very natural way to think about this coming from models that we know about language. But precisely, um, another drastic way to, to think of model-based um, meta-learning would be, well, okay, like these models actually were inspired from machine translation. So um, you know, you could you could start thinking of other meta learning tasks or or few shot learning tasks, such as well, find a regular expression which which you know matches all uppercase with length five, and maybe in text you write a single example like magic would match this regular expression, right? So that's your support set. That's that's not a, a set of images and labels. It's a slightly different language. In fact, it's language, uh, but it's a valid way to define um, obviously a task from a distribution of tasks. And then um, 
the correct answer is not just a function that maps a new input to the desired output. In this case, you just generate literally the program that would satisfy sort of this these specification. So in terms of the formula, we're dropping X, um, but of course uh, there's other tasks that we might actually produce also an X to be put, um, to be mapped through some language instruction. And hopefully if you're, if you're aware of, of this model, you know where I'm going, um, which is the amazing performance that language models have shown and, and attracted lots of attention lately, um, most notably, of course, OpenAI GPTX series precisely is a model-based meta learning that just uses this notion of language modeling and then produces tasks from a distribution that actually is not even a distribution that the, the people training the models had to think too carefully about. It's mostly any task that you come, come up with with some creativity and adjustments um, is able to be performed to some level of uh, dexterity by the model in zero shot fashion, actually, not, not only few shot fashion in the sense that we've never seen um, labels for this task in a, in a precise way during training. We've seen you know, all of the web, let's say, trained to, produ to, pro to produce um, language found in, in websites and so on. Um, but of course, you can also show some examples in the support set, and that's done a lot in, in, in the papers that I, I encourage you to go read. And in that sense, few shot classification is also highly enhanced by this model that is frozen at test time, and it just does quite well at performing a wide, a very diverse variety of textual tasks. Um, and these are just some examples that I found you know, obviously browsing, but there's there's many such examples. Um, the regex one is here, but you see that the same model trained without regard actually of the task distribution, just trying to be as wide of a distribution as possible by training on all of internet. We find that this model has few shot or zero shot capabilities to do quite a diverse set of tasks. Most of which of course are, are, are or all of which are textual um, and based on discrete sequence of, of symbols. So there's a lot of programming tasks as well, but I really love this. And I think it's a nice way to kind of look back to maybe model-based um, clearly has uh, spoken a lot lately. There's, this has gotten a lot of attention. Uh, so it's great to see kind of how these cycles of research look back to the, you know, some very basic ideas in this case, um, simple language modeling happens to be a very powerful few shot learner, meta learner. So concluding thoughts, and then we have a, maybe five or so minutes of questions. If you have any, I'm always happy, of course, to discuss offline as well. Um, but um, one observation that I didn't mention too much, but it, it is, it's been certainly true um, from my understanding of the progress in mini ImageNet is that a lot of progress actually has been driven by better neural architectures and the actual meta learning algorithm hasn't been like a big determiner of, of, of um, performance, although clearly there's been creativity and advancements as well. Uh, but I know that details in the architecture as usual in deep learning matter a whole lot. Uh, I argued that better tasks and also metrics are needed. I would say that I like, for instance, meta world that I haven't spoken about or meta data set is a great one. Um, few shot, zero shot language models, um, I think they're great. Maybe the evaluation metrics are not so standardized and, and it's a bit of like a, a people creativity, you see examples and demos, but maybe we need to think a bit more carefully about evaluation, strictly evaluating these models um, based on language. And then the last thought, again, maybe more for panel discussion is, um, you know, what's meta learning, what's learning, and then some people call this meta, meta, meta learning, uh, which just goes beyond what we understand as meta learning. Um, and in general, we find that these models uh, tend to perform well in the distribution of tasks we've trained on, even in the GPT case, um, if you if you train majorly in English, of course, you cannot just hope that now um, you show it a new language and very quickly it will be as good as a meta learner as it is in English, et cetera, right? So there's always kind of zooming out and more meta, um, which is kind of a fun thing to think about when uh, thinking about meta learning. 
And with that, uh, I think I don't know exactly how to do that, but we can do questions. I might just maybe close the slides and read the chat or you can chat and someone can read the questions. But thanks for your attention, of course, and hope the workshop is, is very fun for you. And hopefully this introductory talk uh, was useful for some of you, if not uh, all of you. And yeah, uh, happy to answer any questions, really. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk, uh, Oriol. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, please, um, uh, if you want to ask any questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself. Otherwise, uh, I, uh, of course, have some questions, but I'm pretty sure that the audience also has uh, burning questions. And I will first uh, turn down the record so that uh, everyone uh, 